All right, y'all, here is your daily cut into what happened in the NBA on December 31st, bringing in the new year with a nice little seven game slate that had a good amount of content produced by it. We had some close ones, we had some blowouts as per usual. And as always, I'll have some uh, timestamps in the description so you can jump around from game to game as you please. And with that being said, let's get into the action from last night. Starting with the Pacers, who survived a late game comeback from the Cleveland Cavaliers, handing them their second loss in a row. And this was due to DeMontis Sabonis coming three assists shy of yet another triple double while also adding 25 points. And I will continue to say it until he gets some recognition, but DeMontis Sabonis is playing like an MVP candidate for this Indiana Pacers team and is a huge key as to why they have had such success to start their season. Through Indiana's first five games, Sabonis is averaging a stat line of 22-11-7. Like I said, he's already looking like the best player on the team, and he has somehow become a threat to be a triple-double every night. But the Pacers also did take a big hit yesterday as it was announced that TJ Warren underwent surgery on his foot and will be out indefinitely, and the Pacers just continue to have this bad injury luck. First it was Old Depot, then pretty much everyone was just kind of banged up last season. Now they lose TJ Warren, the, their bubble hero, from just a little bit ago, and we don't know when he's going to be coming back. Obviously, this is a huge hit for the Pacers because Warren was someone who can go out and get you 30 points on any given night. He was a truly special scorer, and his production will be missed by this team. Although, to be fair, in the first game without him, Doug McDermott stepped up off of the bench with a pretty nice performance, so it'll be interesting to see if he continues to get uh, you know, Warren's lost minutes and how exactly he produces over these next couple of games. And as for the Cavs, it was a case of too little too late as the Sexland backcourt, they added uh, 49 combined points while Andre Drummond also chipped in his usual double-double. But outside of those three, there was very little production from the rest of this Cleveland Cavaliers roster. And, uh, you know, the 3-0 start, it was, I think it's safe to say that it is kind of, it was kind of a fluke start. This Cavs team is good. They have talent in both uh, Darius Garland and Colin Sexton. They've also had other players show flashes like Larry Nance, Jetty Osman. Andre Drummond is just a solid stat sheet stuffer, so I don't necessarily want to say that their 3-0 start was a fluke, but they definitely did better than we expected at the start, and they are already regressing back to their mean. In Washington, the Bulls got their second straight win against the Wizards, while also keeping the Washington Wizards winless on the new season. Otto Porter actually led the way for the Bulls with a 28-point double-double, while Zach Levine added 22, and Kobe White had his own double-double. And I think this was the first game where we really got a decent look at this Bulls team, even though they were still missing a few players due to some health and safety protocols with Lori Markkinen included in that group. Uh, they got Otto Porter back into the starting lineup, and he performed very well. He performed as his contract suggests he should, and after a just injury riddled season where he couldn't really stay on the court whole lot, Otto Porter seems to you know, have found some sort of a way back into his old game. And Thaddeus Young also played in his first game of the season. He came off the bench and provided some good veteran support for the second unit, and was actually on the court at the end of the game. And in combination between Young and Porter, if they can continue to keep up this sort of veteran presence where they're just the steady backbone of this team, this Bulls team might actually end up being a little bit better than they showed at the start of the season. As for the Wizards, I just feel so let down. After this 0-5 start, where I was really far behind them, I was supporting them so much in the offseason, it's already looking like Westbrook is going to be receiving the blame for this terrible start, and that just should not be the case. The real issues on this Washington Wizards team is their defense and their coaching. I mean, we should have known with Scott Brooks in this offseason when Russell Westbrook was traded to Washington, and there was some quote about how Westbrook already knew most of the offense because of he played for Scott Brooks back in OKC, and apparently Scott Brooks is just running the same system that he ran when he was in OKC, which, if we check, was, oh yeah, five whole years ago. So you might wonder why they might be struggling offensively. And then they're also just not good defensively, which does not end up being good at all in any case. Although to be fair, their offense last night looked a lot more reminiscent of last season's offense, or it was very explosive. Westbrook came in, did his usual thing, got a 20 point triple double. Bradley Beal and Thomas Bryant also added 29 points. Each of them, uh, Thomas Bryant had an amazing game. He missed like two shots total throughout the entire game and still had 29, which was very good. Good things to see for Wizards fans, at least, you know, specific good things to see for the Wizards fans, but overall, it's a whole mess. 
Rui Hachimura also looked great in his season debut. He was doing good on offense, doing good on defense. Didn't exactly light up the stat sheet, but had a lot of great plays that look, that make, makes it look like he's ready for a sophomore year leap. But again, this Wizards team in general, they've really dug themselves into a hole and their schedule over the next couple of weeks isn't too easy. So it'll be interesting to see what exactly happens with the Wizards. In Orlando, Philadelphia just simply played harder from the jump, ending the Magic's perfect season behind Embiid, Curry, and Harris, all combining for 62 points. Some quick notes from this blowout, Embiid continues to be dominant in the season. He really seems to have a drive in him that we are yet to see in Joel Embiid, at least for prolonged stretches of time. He really does seem like he is focused on winning this year, which is a great thing to see for Sixers fans. Uh, Tobias Harris put together another good game, which is now two or three in a row, depending on what you qualify as a good game. But either way, this is also like the longest stretch of good basketball that Sixers fans have seen from Tobias Harris. So if he can keep this up, that'll be a huge key in the Sixers actually producing this season. And new offseason acquisition, Seth Curry has also found his stroke yet again from three. He's now shooting over 50% on the season, which is what we're used to seeing from him. And it, another great thing for the Sixers, like they've needed their JJ Redick type shooter and replacement for so many years now, and they finally found it in Curry. And speaking of three-point shooting, Ben Simmons made a three. Just shoot more. Just shoot more threes. Shoot him. And maybe it was just the Ben Simmons Sixers three that is putting me on this side of my thought process, but I think I am believing in the Sixers again, and I'm still being a little hesitant as I dip my toes in because I've been hurt in the past by them many times like many other people, but I think I'm starting to believe in the Sixers again, which is crazy to think. As for Orlando in this game, they just played flat out terrible. Um, yeah, they're, the Sixers put him in a, just a, simply just put him in a straight jacket for the whole 48 minutes. Nikola Vucevic was the only one who had a respectable stat line with 19 and 10, but everyone else was just missing every single shot. Uh, they shot 7 of 28 from 3, and you're just you're probably not going to win many games when you have that kind of a shooting night, and unfortunately it was just one of those kinds of nights for the Magic. In Houston, the Rockets outlasted the Sacramento Kings to pick up their first win of the season as they finally had their full team healthy and active and playing on the same court at the same time. James Harden led the way as usual with a 33-8 and eight stat line and he also scored 16 points in the final four minutes of the game which is pretty impressive as he got off to a pretty slow start. It was the rest of the Rockets keeping them close in the game but as always it was Harden who came up at the end of the fourth quarter and hit all the big shots, the big threes, got to the foul line all the good stuff that we know Harden for. And speaking of the supporting cast, Christian Wood added a 21 point double-double, John Wall came assist shy of a double-double with 22 points as well, Boogie didn't really have a crazy stat line but he showed us why he is still a good player on a basketball team, he had some amazing post moves and just dimes and dishes and assists and I just love to watch Boogie Cousins play, even the watered down post Achilles, post ACL, post quad tear injury uh, Boogie Cousins, still a great watch. And overall, it just feels it feels illegal how much fun I'm having watching this Rockets team. Like, Eric Gordon is still an amazing scorer off the bench. Jay Sean Tate just has an absolutely crazy motor that whenever I see him on my TV, he just makes me want to be active and just go do something. Go go hoop on some people on my local Y. That's the type of player Jay Sean Tate is, and I love it. But yeah, James Harden actually has a good supporting cast for probably the first time in his career in Houston and I think they're I really hope they hold on to him because they're going to be a very exciting team to watch as they you know get some better chemistry and grow together develop together they're going to be good and now the Kings they kept it close and it was actually surprising because they really didn't play that great of a game their shooting percentages weren't too great they didn't have any one player step up as a lead scorer but yet they were still in this game down to the end of the fourth. And honestly, as of right now, if the Kings keep this up, I really wouldn't be surprised if they find themselves in the playoff hunt at the end of the season. I obviously, I'm not quite putting them in the contenders tier yet because they just don't, they, they have a very talented roster, but they're still missing that closer type player that you can just give the ball at the end of the games in half court offense scenarios and just have them go either get to the foul line or get a clutch bucket. They still need that sort of role on their team, which is why I'm yet to put them in the you know contender tier that you know in the hunt tier for any you know going anywhere in the playoffs in toronto the raptors also finally got into the win column for the first time this season 
as they beat a Knicks team behind 25 points from Fred Van Vliet and 20 points from Kyle Lowry. But the big story from this one came right before the tip-off as Pascal Siakam. It was announced that he was going to be, I don't know if suspended is the right word, but he missed this game due to some disciplinary actions where he apparently left the court early. I didn't even hear about this at, during the time, but apparently he left the court early uh, before the end of the game against the Sixers and their loss at the Sixers when uh, you know he fouled out left the court, I guess, before the game officially expired, therefore the team suspended him for this next game. And although they got the win, this really wasn't even a good game for the Raptors, they just kind of played less bad than the Knicks, who, the Knicks had a historically bad night, they they shot 3 of 36 from 3, which is quite odd, I couldn't find the numbers for it, but I would assume that's probably one of the worst team shooting nights in NBA history since the 3 point line has been added, so... Yeah, the Raptors kind of got a gimme here. For the Knicks, Julius Randle did squeak away with a double-double, but their, their team was very injury-riddled. 83 points is never going to be enough for a win, and I, for one, just can't wait for the rookies, Obi Toppin, Emmanuel Quickly, all those guys to get back into the lineup because, if we're being honest, those two are probably the only reason we're really watching the Knicks this year. In OKC, the Pelicans handled the Thunder by 30 points, and it was, it was a pretty boring game. Um, they outscored the Thunder 28-7 in the fourth quarter, which is pretty much the only thing you really need to know from this one. Outside of the fact that Brandon Ingram scored 20 points and then was ejected from the game on a questionable call, uh, he did make contact by you know, swinging into a player's head, but he was going for the block. It didn't really look intentional, but rules are rules, so that was some interesting thing that happened. But you know, outside of that, uh, Steven Adams, Josh tried double-doubles, Zion was in foul trouble, so... He didn't really even play most of the game, this is kind of a rest night for him, he only played 17 minutes, and that was about it for the Pelicans. And for the Thunder, I, I, I looked into this game after looking at the Knicks game, and I thought the Knicks had the worst night offensively, but this Thunder team was god awful, just so bad. Al Horford and Mike Muscola were the only players to reach double digits in the points column, and they just, they shot so terribly. I guess this is the Thunder team that we were expecting from the offseason, you know, prior to the start of this year, and they fully delivered, although I guess in their case, they're probably trying to lose games, not actively trying to lose games, but, you know, you, they're tanking. That, they're, yeah, they're tanking. And finally, the last game of the night was the Phoenix Suns versus the Utah Jazz, and the Suns moved to 4-1 and one behind a 25-point effort from Devin Booker. And for the Suns, I just have to say, I did not give them enough credit. I thought that they would be a good team in the season, and while I wasn't wrong about that, I was wrong about the ways in which I thought they would be a good team. The Suns legitimately go nine players deep in their rotation. They have Dario Saric, who just got back and has been playing great so far in two games. Cam Johnson's had some good scoring nights and is just evolving as a playmaker and defender. Uh, Campaign has been surprisingly good since coming back to the NBA, one of the good finds of the you know free agent markets in the past year or so. And then they also have... Um, Javon Carter, who's just an absolute bulldog of a defender and harasses opposing guards at will. And like I said, the Suns are now 4-1, and one. they have a lot of convincing wins, and that's with Devin Booker only averaging 20 points a game, which is pretty crazy when you consider the fact that in Devin Booker's five seasons prior to this one, he's averaged over 20 points in four of them. So this, so far, he's averaging his second least amount of points per game. And again, this is just not all how I expected the season to go for the Phoenix Suns. On the flip side, Donovan Mitchell had 23 points in the losing effort for the Utah Jazz. And from what I've seen, he's taking a lot of the blame so far. At least people are putting the blame on Mitchell for this 2-2 two and two start for the Jazz, which I'm just going to come and say it. 2-2 two and two is not even a terrible start. They might have had some bad losses in those two losses, but again, not even a terrible start when compared to some other teams around the league. But people are getting on Donovan Mitchell for his poor shooting to start the season, and while his numbers are worse than usual, it's only been four games for them, so again, small sample size, but also it could just be a rough start to the season, and Donovan Mitchell has always been known as a kind of inefficient scorer, so I don't, there's nothing really new here that is different from what Mitchell's done in the past. I think it's just a case that he is starting out the season a bit colder than usual, and he'll probably regress to the mean at some point. The real worry for Jazz fans should be Bojan Bogdanovic, they're usually second best scorer on the team. He averaged 20 points per game last season, 
Ben, he missed the bubble, obviously hasn't played in nine months like some of the other teams around the league, and he's come back and his shooting percentages are way worse than usual. He's only averaging 12 points per game to start the new season, and again, th this should be the guy that Jazz fans are a little bit more worried about. Again, the man hasn't played in nine months, so I will cut him a bit of slack there, but Bogdanovich is getting up there in age, and this could honestly be the start of the downfall if this keeps up. It'll definitely be something to monitor because, like I said, he was their second best scorer last season behind Mitchell, and it would be very important to the team's success that they have their second best scorer retain his role as the second best scorer while not being a huge negative for the team while on the court. But overall, when it does come to the Utah Jazz this season, I'm not too worried yet. Again, they're 2-2, two and two, which isn't a terrible record at all when compared to some of the other teams around the league. And on the bright side, while Mitchell and Bogdanovich haven't been great, two players who have been great are Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert. Gobert is doing his usual 18-14 and 14 routine throughout a season. He's also just playing solid defense. Gobert is always a lock for those types of numbers, and Mike Conley is playing like his old Grizzly self. He's shooting efficiently, he's scoring the ball a whole lot more than he did last season, and I mean really anything compared to last season would be better for Mike Conley as long as he was just doing okay, which in this case he is, and again, the Jazz still have some bright spots, it's just going to take Mitchell and Bogdanovich a little bit of time to regress back to the mean and become the players they once were, hopefully. But that is it for this daily cut recap of December 31st. As always, drop some comments down below on what you thought about these games. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video or enjoy this type of content. And as always, most importantly, thank you for watching.